God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Welcome. Welcome to worship this 12th Sunday after Pentecost, or as some uh, call it, ordinary time, this 23rd day of August. Whether you're gathered here in the sanctuary or joining us online, uh, we are gathered to worship the Lord Almighty and welcome each and every one of you. We serve an awesome God, a God of power and might, and yet a God of love and forgiveness. As the psalmist declares in 105 verses 1 to 4, give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him, tell of his wonderful acts, glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice, look to the Lord in his strength, seek his face always. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That, that, that's not the one that is uh, as common, but uh, we'll work that in as well. Participating in leading worship this morning are uh, Mark and Denise, who's playing the piano, uh, Betsy Hoover, who will be reading the scripture, Robin and Shana Denise, who will be. Uh, Providing special music. Uh, Robin Denise is also uh, caring for the recording of uh, this morning's services. Three weeks from today, the 13th, if I can count it right, the 13th of September, that's the second Sunday of September, we have one more Sunday this month, uh, we're going to be worshiping in the park and have a parish picnic. The two churches are gathering together, East End and Jagger First. We will be at the Lions Park in Greenwood. If you don't know where it is, it's easy to go right by without noticing, but if you go up Pleasant Valley and turn left and go in front of the uh, Greenwood Church, it's on the right hand side, but you gotta go on through the next light and to the right to get into it to find the entrance. It's not hard if you know where you're looking, but if you don't know where you're looking, who knows? But, uh, so that's why I'm sharing. They would like to have an idea of how many people are coming. Uh, they're not asking for reservations, but if, if uh, I think we have a sign-up sheet in the back, uh, I'm not sure, but if we don't today, we will by next week. Uh, if we can have uh, names of people who will be coming, we're not going to check off your name to see whether you actually came or whether you showed up without signing in. We just want to, they just, I said we, they just want to have an idea. Hot dogs, hamburgers, condiments, coffee, water, and juice, I believe, will be provided. Uh, you're asked to bring your own table set uh, because the pandemic and that they thought it might be uh, a little better uh, doing it that way to, to do that. Bring your own table setting. You're welcome to bring chairs. Uh, we will be using the pavilion, and I would imagine most of us will be sitting around the tables for the picnic lunch, but you can sit around the tables or use your chairs uh, for worship. Worship will be at 10 a.m. It'll be an hour earlier than what we used to here, but uh, a little later uh, for the other folks. But, uh, 10 o'clock to start worship at noonish. Um, they'll be having uh, our, be having our picnic lunch. That's on uh, September the 13th. Now, I sorry I don't have these written out for you. These these instructions, but I will be putting them in the e news this week. Some of you might have. Uh, your email address, and you have received something from me already. Uh, I, I made this announcement last week, and two folks have given me their email addresses since then, and uh, they will be included. If you'd like to be included in the e news, now I know not everybody has email, so if you don't have it, but we'll try to make sure that Margie has the information here at the office so that that's available if anybody has any questions. I know that's a, that's a whole long list of details, but a little much for not having it in writing, but uh, 
will we'll work on that. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Okay. We'll work on that one too. But uh, when Jesus asked his disciples to provide food for over 5,000 people, and that's a great number count, uh, they asked in astonishment if they should go and spend up to eight months' wages on bread. They had not yet appreciated Jesus for who he was. The disciples were still pondering, still confused, still unbelieving. They did not realize that Jesus could provide for them. So they were preoccupied with the immensity of the task that they could not see what was possible to God. Do you let what seems impossible about Christianity keep you from believing? Let us pray. God of our hopes and dreams, we are empty and long to be filled. We are hungry and long to be fed. We are lost and long to be found. Gather us into your love and pick up the pieces of our lives. Just as Jesus gathered up the fragments of the five loaves and two fish that remained after feeding the five thousand, call us anew to eat our fill and to find our true nourishment in Jesus, the bread of life. And now we have our prayer.
people. As far as you can see, near and far and all around. So this story starts out in a sort of unusual way. First of all, I have a question for you. Do you like to eat out? Do you like to eat out at a Greetings, 
Thank you, Father. Appreciate it. That was a pretty song. God is good. All the time. All the time. Let's try that again. I think you kind of, you started out well, but kind of came off there a little bit, I think. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. All right. That sounds much better. Thank you. I told him at East End when I got done with this part. I said, one of these days, it won't be today, I promise you. I will use it in the middle of my sermon just to see if you're still awake. So with me. But, uh, We'll, we'll not try that yet. How do you respond when faced with an impossible task? Now you might ask, what is an impossible task? But what is an impossible task for you? What are some tasks or some things that you've been faced with that just seem impossible? When you're up against the impossible, do you cry out, alas, woe is me? Do you fold up your tent and walk away? Do you cut and run? Or are you immobilized and not able to do a thing? Or how do you respond? It didn't seem like much. It didn't seem like much at all. Not hardly worth mentioning. But it was all they had. It was quite a dilemma. They barely had enough for a few, let alone for thousands. Now what led up to this situation? Jesus and his disciples had gone out to a lonely place, only well, wasn't so lonely when thousands of people showed up. But what had happened is Jesus was busy. He had been busy going to the region, going to towns and villages, sharing the good news. He had sent out the twelve, two by two, and by the time they got back together, where they had planned to be, where they had planned to be, Jesus had learned that John, who we call the Baptist, death. Now, I don't know if you remember from the Christmas stories, actually the Advent stories before Christmas. John was a cousin to Jesus. Now I'm not saying they're first cousins, I'm not quite sure. We know that Mary and Elizabeth, their mothers, were cousins. And, and uh, John was several months older than Jesus. And his job had been to prepare the way, and he had been arrested because he spoke out against something that Herod was doing. And he eventually lost his head for it, I mean, literally. And when Jesus heard of that, that hit him hard. And the disciples coming back, they had a lot of news to share of what had happened. And there were a lot of people around, and it was kind of hard to. To manage, and so what they did, Jesus said, Let's take the boat and go. But well, people saw Jesus and the disciples get the boat, and they knew he was going out somewhere, and they started to gather up and go. And the word spread through the towns and villages in the area, and thousands and thousands of people ended up there. How do we know? We're told that there were 5,000 men. And we're told how many women and children. But there were well more than 5,000 people there. And the wind must not have been all that great that day because the people got there on foot before Jesus got there in the boat. And when he got out of the boat, when he was on shore, there was all these people. What would you have done if you were in charge of that moment? Think about it for a moment. What would you have done? I can imagine some 
would think, well, I'm not going to vote, go somewhere else. Well, there are other possibilities, but what Jesus did, Jesus had compassion. Jesus did not pass the responsibility on to someone else. He found the time in his hectic schedule. And so he spent the rest of the day with this crowd of people, teaching, sharing. And it began to get late. The disciples saw a need and acted on it. I'm sure they were tired and hungry themselves and knew that these people who walked the whole way and been there all day they must have been tired and hungry as well. And now the disciples knew that they could go and take care, get rest or get food or anything while we had all these people here. They also knew that as long as they were there, not only could they not do something, they, how were we going to take care of these people? Now they saw a need. And they came up with a plan. Now they came up with a plan before they consulted Jesus. They came up with a plan to consult with Jesus. Sometimes when we do that, we find that, oh, God has different ideas and we try to tell God what our plans are. Rather than asking what are God's plans. But when, it came, when they came to Jesus, their plan was, let's send these people away so they can go to the neighboring towns and villages and buy food to eat. They must be hungry. And certainly, we're all tired. But Jesus said to them, you give them something. wasn't saying, oh, they are hungry, let's figure out what to do. He said, you give them something to eat. Now, that is an impossible task. During children's time, we heard about, you know, if, if you had a bus load of people coming out to McDonald's, whether they supersize your meal or not, um, you can have anywhere from 30 to 40 people getting off the bus. When a bus pulls in to McDonald's or a Burger King or any place else like that, they start just putting up more food on the grill without that making for the order because they know that they'll be overwhelmed for a little while. But there were no McDonald's. And 50 people will really take up a lot of time and effort and energy in one fast food place. And if you multiply that by 10, that's only 500. You gotta multiply it by 10 again, in other words, 500, you get 5,000. And that's just the men, not the women and children. Jesus said, you give them something to eat. He took the concern and asked them to translate it into action. It's good to have concern, because without concern, it's going to be kind of hard to get to the action part, but don't stop with the concern. Let's go to action. Now, what would they do? That was an impossible task. Even when they scrounged up all they had, five loaves of bread, and, and not one of those big uh, economy size, you know, little loaves of individual uh, loaves, bread and two fish. A good meal for a couple of people, but not for 12, let alone 5,000 plus. That's what they had, but they brought it to Jesus. The disciples perceived a need. And they came up with a solution, or so they thought. 
Jesus told them to show concern for others. They didn't have the resources though to do it. Not even enough for themselves. Why, their solution in the first place, they knew they could do no better than that to begin with. Isn't that the way we are? We see a need, we lack of resources, um, we come up with our own solutions and pass the responsibility on to others. When we do things that way, we don't really accomplish much. And it's not just because we don't have much to offer, but because we're not even offering what we have. What we have doesn't seem like much at all. But when it's all we have, that's all that Jesus asked of us. He didn't tell the disciples, you go find enough loaves of bread so I can give one to every person. He didn't say, go find enough fish so that we can give one, at least one fish to every two people. No, he said, what do you have? Bring it to me. They found five loaves and two fish. See, Jesus never asked for more than we're able to give. Often, what God asks of us is more than we're willing to give, but never more than what we're able. Jesus asked for no more than what they had. He blessed it, used it. I kind of like that uh, phrase. He supersized the meal. I mean, that's really supersizing. Two, lo uh, two fish and five loaves of bread for 5,000 people, that's supersizing plus. And we're told that everyone had their fill and 12 baskets of leftovers were collected. Yes, the disciples had a dilemma. They couldn't take care of it on their own, and neither can we on our own. But God never asked anything of us without supplying what we need. When Jesus asked what we would have, five well, loaves, two fish. It, no, it didn't seem like much because it wasn't much. But Jesus took what little they had and were wonders. When Jesus asked of you, what do you have? How do you respond? What do you do? What do you say? When Jesus asks, what do you have? In the hands of Jesus, a little is always much. We think we may not be much, but if we allow ourselves to be in Jesus' hands, a little is much. We may not be much on our own, but in Jesus' hands, do a whole far more than what we've been capable of. We may think that what we have is little, or that we have little or no power, little or no substance. But that's no reason for hopeless pessimism. The one fatal thing to say is, for all that I could do is not worth my while to do anything. Because if we're not willing to do anything, God cannot and will not use us. If now God's not using you for something, it may well be that you're not willing to allow God. Or if you are, you're not willing to allow God to take you in the direction. story when I googled it up I, I googled the starfish story um, it's actually entitled the star thrower and it's part of a 16 page essay uh, by the same name written by Lauren Isley uh, back in 1969 
But this part, this this part of the essay, this story has been used over and over, uh, often by motivational speakers and, and others, and it has been adapted, and I've been able to find ways uh, where it's the original story is a man came across an old man. But I find that in the story, the, the, um, what, a man and a girl, Jesus and a man, one of the, the, the way that I'm most familiar with it is a man coming across the water. And the story goes, the story adapted goes like this. One day an old man was walking along a beach that was littered with thousands of starfish that had been washed ashore by the high tide. As he walked, he came upon a young boy who was eagerly throwing the starfish back into the ocean, one by one. Puzzled, the man looked at the boy and asked what he was doing. Without looking up from his mask, the boy simply replied, I'm saving these starfish, sir. The old man chuckled aloud, Son, there are thousands of starfish on this beach, and only one of you. What difference can you make? The boy reached down again, picked up the starfish, and tossed it back out to the ocean. And turning to the man, he said, I made a difference for that one. Jesus isn't asking us to save the world. That's God's job. But what Jesus is asking us to go make a difference in the world, where we are, where we can, with what we have. When we put ourselves in the hands of Jesus, there is no telling what he can and will do with and through us. God's part, or our truth, our part, God will not do. God's part, we cannot do. But God still asks us to do our part. As we go to the morning offering, of course, we're not passing the offering plates uh, this morning uh, as we worship during this pandemic, but um, we do have a basket in the back and an offering plate up here for your offerings. And I want to thank you for your continued support and the work and ministry of the church during these times, both those of you who are present and those of you who will send it in. Your faithfulness bears witness to Christ. For those in attendance this morning, as I already said, we have the offering uh, plates uh, for you. For those who are participating virtually, you may take part in worship with your tithes and offerings by mailing them to Jackson First United Methodist Church, 1801 Pleasant Valley Boulevard, Altoona, 16602. As Jesus said, in, as recorded in Matthew 6, verses 2, 3, and 4, So when you get to the needy, do not announce of the trumpets, as the hypocrites do, in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you get to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your hearing may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Let us pray. Merciful God, the gifts we bring are so small in comparison to the mass needs of our world. Nowhere near enough to save the thousands dying of starvation around the world, or even to meet the needs of the hungry and homeless here at home. Yet we have brought what we can. As you once multiplied the five loaves and the two fish, multiply these gifts as well so that once again the hungry may receive all they need and more. Amen.
God will not do. God's heart, we cannot do. We need to know the difference and do our part and allow God to do God's part. When facing a seemingly impossible task, do what you can and look to God for the rest. And now may the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Oh.